back. And we've got this script from Gideon Defoe. We've got um, character designs. And the first thing we needed was, um, was a, a production designer. And uh, this gentleman is Norman Garwood. And Norman uh, came very highly recommended from his CV. Because he'd done um, Brazil with Terry Gilliam. He'd done um, The Princess Bride. Yeah. He'd done um, Hook. <laughs> it was a pirate film, what can you say? In fact, actually, it was quite annoying because at a certain stage, I, suddenly, I watched Hook uh, years in, and I realised that he'd actually just ripped off his own ideas for Hook to re reuse on the pirate movie. And uh, in his young days, as a young man, he'd worked on The Benny Hill Show. So he just, he just ticked all the boxes there. And Norman is quite brilliant and, and borderline loony, I think. And, um, and uh, he did thousands of drawings. And um, to be honest, I, I will be honest, it, they weren't what I expected. When you work at like DreamWorks or like at Pixar or Disney, the walls are lined with glorious concept art. It's, it's an it's a end in itself. There's fabulous, beautiful concept art everywhere because they... They, all these companies employ a dozen of the finest artists from all around the world to produce them these beautiful drawings. Um, we don't have that. It's not part of our culture. So, so Norman didn't do that. He just kept doing these mad drawings, which were, which were all about ideas. Actually, that's not fair. They were about ideas, and ultimately they were about detail too, but they didn't tell me anything about atmosphere. He didn't, doesn't really do atmosphere. He just does uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, that was, I think that was... That was Bellamy's cabin when, when Bellamy had a scene on board his ship. Uh, London docks. London, a bit more detail. Uh, just, just, he kept on doing his drawing. And like, they are, you know, that's, that's, quite, that's quite a finished drawing. They're full of detail, full of lines. You know, not much colour, very little colour, very little atmosphere, but just ideas, ideas, ideas. And he kept churning about. And he, as I said, he did thousands. Um, eventually, that one, yes, that one got coloured, probably because we needed to show it to the studio, because uh, Norman wouldn't, wouldn't do it for our sake, but we needed to show it to Sony to tell them what we were doing. And so that's, that was a coloured drawing, and then after many more processes, eventually it turned into that on the screen, so that's quite interesting, interesting comparison, really. It's like, you know, uh, eh, quite a lot, eh, not bad, not bad. A lot of the... A lot of the much of the detail in his ideas absolutely survives. Um, and I was very happy with that. I mean, he was, he was a marvellous, marvellous creative brain, very playful, very mischievous, a troublemaker. Um, and, uh, and the gap between what he drew and what ended up on the screen was very much filled in by the art team. We had a fantastic art department of people. people. Whereas Norman was, was new to us, but the art directors were people we'd worked with, like um, Matt Perry. We'd worked with him for years and years and years. And so he, there was just instinctive understanding of what I wanted that didn't have to be explained in detail. I didn't need to see you know, every, every lamp, every, every skull and crossbones. I kind of trusted that, 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 that they would do this translation job, which they did heroically well. So the, now there's a short clip which shows some of the... Some of the um, set design process. Then this is Phil now doing the technical drawings, um, obviously a lot of interpretation. He does the technical drawings which go to the set builders. And the set builders is a company called Cod Stakes, also in Bristol. We took his drawings and copied it onto foam gauze so we could imagine the world in three dimensions because we think in three dimensions and that was much more helpful to work in this form than in paper. So it's built off site and brought into the studio. Um, and I'll come on to the finished sets in a minute. So, so Norman's doing that. In parallel, same time, we're designing the puppets. There's a very, very large cast of puppets in this film. And the design was done by a guy called Johnny Duddle, uh, who was absolutely brilliant. We, again, we tried, I must say, we tried several designs. We had, um, we had six or seven um, designs that we tried out. And it's a very personal thing, extremely personal. And uh, Johnny 
had the instincts that, that suited us very well. Again, a sense of fun. His drawings were very lively and very full of fun. So he would do all the drawings. And my next clip just shows you uh, stuff, stuff being built. Let's see, stuff being built. So here we go. So here we are. Here's, this is what you expect to see. Somebody carving plasticine. Lee carving plasticine. Yeah, metal work for the uh, armature and so on. I'm frankly, I'm just. You know, this, is good, this is a good bit. This is fun. <laughs> How cute is that? <laughs> and tons and tons of painting. In, that, in this very short clip, all I was really doing, never mind the detail, I was just trying to celebrate and share with you a little bit of the craft that goes into it. Because, because craft is like everything in what we do. You know, you've, got, you've got a workshop full of people with incredible, uh, incredible craft talents. You've got sculptors working in plasticine, you've got specialist mould makers, you've got specialist foamers, specialist armature makers, people that work in, in wood and metal and resin and plaster, stuff I can do to save my life. I could never do any of that technical stuff. A huge team of them, all with their speciality. And that's the joy of puppet animation. That's the thing that, that really, you know, this isn't... I mean, although I'm telling you, I'm trying to explain what it looks like, but, but more important than what it looks like for me is what it feels like. And what it feels like is you're working in this fantastic um, community of artists. You know, and that's, that's what they are. You're surrounded by people who are brilliant at what they do um, and, and all bringing their skills together in a wonderfully collaborative way. And the, the, the art department was a glorious place to visit. You know, wherever you go, you, you saw there like some hands lying around. Um, wherever you go, there's bizarre bits of limbs. You know, there's a there's a plastic cup full of reject feet. You know, there's there are uh, plasticine sculpts that fail that, that didn't look right. Um, Molds everywhere. It's just great. It's just a great atmosphere. I don't know how many there were in the art department. Like, it's hard to to introduce counting, but but I guess it would go up to about you know sixty at most. You know, a lot a lot of people with all their specialist skills. And uh, I'm so you know, happy to have worked with those guys. They're such a great, great team. So the next thing, okay, so there, so that, I'm aware I've shown you loads of people working, which is my plan. Um, uh, um, that, this is a pirate captain. He was made at least four times in plasticine. Um, and those, the first two were um, attempts that probably didn't quite work. You know, but just, just artistically, aesthetically, it didn't quite work. Uh, then he's made for... He's, he's built by a sculptor for impact. You know, heroic pose, you know, with his cutlass and stuff like that. And that's great. That, and everyone looks at that and says, oh, ooh, he looks great in action. And then he has to be rebuilt entirely like this so he can be moulded, because it's, it's, ridic it's astonishingly um, technical. Making a you, know, you can't take a mould off that, let me assure you. So although it's all plasticine, and it's got to look right, it's got to look coherent, it's got to look like one piece, but it has to be broken down into sections so they can be cast. So his arm, his arm is cut off the shoulder, and the arm is you know, maybe cast separately from the, from the body. Actually, that's not true. That was a lie. I think the arm was cast with the body. But that kind of thing happens the whole time. Um, and that's him emerging, finally finished. And this is um, part of how he breaks down. But by no means all of it, actually. It's a magnificent piece of work. Um, and um, the... What can I tell you? The, the middle of his face, which... <laughs> Just above his, just above his moustache, the middle of his face is hard resin with lots of gripping points. The mouth shapes are printed resin. 
The moustache would be uh, silicon, I think. The beard is silicon. The coat, the arms, and the sleeves are latex. The hands are silicon. And you can see we've got different hands because although they're really well made, these hands, and they're very beautiful, they would never make a good fist. Because if, when you clench them to a fist, because it's bendy silicon and wire, it would, the lines would always be soft. So we built specialist fists um, and specialist grabbing hands to hold swords and so on. Um, and the, uh, the trousers, latex, the boots, silicon. So very, very, multi, very, very multimedia and a fantastic, amazing piece of work. So, um, but if I can remind you, an amazing, amazing piece of work which absolutely depends on a piece of plasticine in the first place. Uh, and before that, depends on sketches. So th the trick is, the trick is somehow, to, uh, if you can, is to keep the life of a sketch, a lively sketch full of, full of vigour, to keep that through to the finished model. That's, that's what we're striving for the whole time. So, um, so there's his body. There's his body. And now here he is. This is his head now. This is being, being scanned in. Scanned into the computer. And we end up making, as you would imagine, um, a CG version of his head, but absolutely scanned in from plasticine. So we didn't, we, didn't, you know, we didn't build that head. We scanned it in. And we, the, I'm obviously working up towards doing the lip sync. Now, the lip sync, you see. Um, ah, now my visual aid. Tasty assortment box of, of assorted mouth shapes, right? So, so the mouth shapes are printed, rapid prototyping, and um, it needs some. It needs some uh, apologising for. With Wallace, Wallace and Gromit, he also has substitute mouth shapes. Wallace has a line across here, and underneath the famous big Wallace mouth, there's something like, I don't know, 15 different shapes. And they're made of plasticine. They're made of plasticine uh, with uh, hard resin teeth. So the, yeah, the teeth, in fact, thinking about it, the top teeth, the top teeth are stuck in his head. The top teeth go with the upper part of his face, and the mouth is stuck on top of that, so that, so that the teeth don't boil around, but the mouth moves around the teeth. And it's all plasticine. And because it's plasticine, the animator can adjust it a bit. I mean, the, the, the broad shapes, these 15 or 20 broad shapes are given, but the animator can keep adjusting it as he goes along, which is what animators love to do. Um, and every frame, the animator has to clean that line up by hand. They smooth it in. And um, I watched this being done uh, not quite doing a time and motion study, but I watched it being done in the studio, and I thought, wow, that's taking a lot of time to, to do all that smoothing in. And what the animators were doing was they're working on the set, I don't need to explain it to most of you, working on the set with a puppet, then they take the head off, and they go across the room, and put the head on a little stick, and sit down, and work on the head to get it right, and then go back and put it on the puppet, and carry on. And I thought... I felt that that was like destructive rather because it broke the, broke the flow and they spent a lot of their day smoothing, smoothing plasticine, which is not for me really what animators are meant to be doing. They've got more important things to be doing than making plasticine smooth. They're meant to be performing is what they're meant to be doing. And I, so I felt that this process was slightly disruptive. But also, but also, it all came down to the the famous luxuriant beard. Because in the script made much play of the captain's luxuriant beard, so we knew we had to have one. And how the hell were you to get a luxuriant beard to fit around a plasticine mouth shape, especially a plasticine mouth shape changing you know, dramatically like... Um, 
Uh, a mouse shape changes dramatically. Say, so Wallace's mouse shape changes. So, um, I didn't want to get into rapid prototyping, actually, but it it was a solution. It was a creative solution to a, a whole series of problems that we had, especially this damn beard. Uh, if it hadn't said beard in the script, life would be much, much easier. Uh, as it is, that, that I, I'll just do it very gently. I'll very, very gently show you. It's so gentle. Uh, the beard stretches. The beard stretches. I pull it down, take out the mouth, and put a new mouth in. I was, I'm not going to do it anymore because I can feel it decaying, and I haven't got anyone to make me a new beard, <coughs> make him a new beard, and um, and it's rather, it's kind of it's kind of sad with puppet animation because um, uh, you you get these beautiful puppets, and in in five years' time he'll be completely knackered. You know, he'll be he'll be he'll be falling apart, and so I want I want to keep him as good as I can. But that was. That was why we went for the, the rapid prototype mouths. Uh, and I assume in the modern age, everyone knows what that looks like, but I'll just go through. So we've got a CG version of his head. We actually made um, eight different plasticine mouths to try and establish the way his face moved in plasticines, in the medium that we understand. But then, having done that, we scanned them all in, and we went into, into CG, into Maya. So here we have a typical scene, a typical scene of uh, somebody fooling around, actually. Um, it's just playing acting the ghost. Avast! I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your goal. Duh. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't. I I hate that actually. I still I, because it's so dead. You know, I, I still hate to watch it. But it was, it was a process we went through um, to get to something great at the end. And so um, that little sequence on the park, I'm there for, here for your goal, um, breaks down into I don't know twenty different mouth shapes, some repeated perhaps. Uh, and then from, from that information, which is now all in Maya, we print them out. We print them out using these, these handy um, water coolers that we have. Um, so that's an, that's an RP machine. This is really confusing, isn't it? That's actually, that's actually, that's, that's, four, that's four RP machines in a row. And this wheel of the age, I can barely read it myself. Those are mouth shapes. The, the B printed out, and, and now, I, I, so now I thought it would be really interesting to um, uh, shoot it time lapse, so, so we could see it all happening. But it's, it's a damn sight less interesting than I thought it was going to be. But, but we've done it, so, so I'll show it to you anyway. Here we are. This is this is overnight. I think rising up the foreground, the mouths are emerging from a here we are, they're emerging from a, a primeval bath of resin. Mouth shapes emerging. There they go. There we go. Um, and then, and the, so that that's it. Those are mouth shapes. Um, so they come out of the bath. All very technical, you know. So, so far, so technical. Now, now teams of slaves are called upon to um, <laughs> tidy them up. And mostly recent graduates from the University of West of England. Very cheap. <laughs> and there's so the, and very, very scary. Um, scalpel work here it makes me wince every time. Um, so, cleaning up, um, they had to clean up. They had to um, spray them, and then, and in spraying you had to mask them off because if you because you spray one colour for the skin, one colour for the tongue, one colour for the teeth, and one colour for the lips. So it's a huge amount of masking and spraying and cleaning. Having said that. They came out of the process. Oh, here we are. Here we are. A typical box of mouths. Having talked about all that cleaning up, I will say that they came out of the bath in amazingly. The, the, the resolution is extraordinary. They were absolutely fabulous, clean, high resolution. And the guys, um, the team, were brilliant at, at colour matching. So to colour match spray paint to 
through plasticine because part, parts of the faces were... They're, they're, yeah, parts of the faces were, were hard resin and parts were plasticine, so they had to match, get the colour to match exactly right. Um, and so it's a massive, massive technical achievement. And we had a huge library, and now I can show you, again, uh, an impression of, of how it works on the studio floor. But Captain London, the home of Queen Victoria, Captain London, the home of Queen Victoria, mortal enemy of pirates everywhere, will end up hanged at execution dock. <gasps> Charles Darwin, at your service. <laughs> so, um, uh, are, are, are we done here? That's the library. That's the mouth library. And so there were thousands of these damn things. The, the, the pirate captain, the pirate captain is talking the whole way through the film. Um, and, he's, and sometimes he's laughing, and sometimes he's angry, and sometimes he's sad. So he's, so he's a lot of mouths. I think he had about 250 different mouths. That's... That's excessive. Um, but, but he was on the screen the whole time. The background character would have like 20 different mouths. But, of course, I say 250 different mouths, there isn't just one pirate captain. On the studio floor, there are 30 pirate captains. Uh, we, didn't have to make, we didn't have to make a full set for him every time, luckily. So we didn't, but still, there were, I don't know how many, how many uh, more than a thousand pirate captain mouths in the studio. Uh, and just... Um, um, production managing to make sure the right mouths for the right shots, the right piece of dialogue were available on the right set at the right time was itself a mind-boggling achievement. I couldn't have done it, on, I couldn't have done it at all. But um, that, that's how it's done. So, um, and then the funny thing is, I'm talking about this, you know, and uh, I feel I should share it with you. Oh, no, painting out the lines, that's the other thing, that's the other thing. So, you, 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 those at the front can see he's got a, you know, well, believe me he's got a line on his face and, and that has to be painted out digitally uh, every every frame so that's another process now I was quite sort of um, calculating really uh, for me the priceless time the priceless thing is animators on sets with puppets that's the point and I was happy to push on the work onto those hapless young slaves from, from the University of West England, I was happy to push the work onto the guys doing the digital paint out afterwards so that the animators had more time to animate. That was what it was all about. That, that's, a, that's a luxuriant beard. Um, I say all this, you know, perhaps overstretching the point, maybe perhaps possibly boring you as I talk about rapid prototyping. But, and then the joke is, as I said to the animators, you're not meant to be looking at the bloody lip sync anyway because, you know, uh, when you see a film, you're a very strange viewer indeed if you watch the actor's mouth. You're not meant to. You, meant to, you look at their eyes, don't you, for, for performance. So the, so the mouth is like, I always felt rather resentful. Like it, it had to be right, because if it was wrong, there's always someone to say, oh, your lip sync's a bit wrong there, mate. You know, but you, you shouldn't be looking at the bloody lip sync. And then everywhere else in the world, they dub it into French anyway, and the lip sync goes right out the window. So, and, um, <laughs> but still, but, but we, we spent a lot of time on it. Um, and for me, I must say, uh, as a director, I just forgot about it. You know, I, I just uh, I let the, the animation supervisor worry about that and the rapid prototyping department and the floor manager, and I just got on with the performance, which is what I cared about. Thank you for downloading this podcast from Birmingham City University. For more information, please go to itunes.bcu.ac.uk.